get ready to be amazed by the incredible wonders of maternal and affectionate love. Today, we're embarking on an adventure through the corridors of neuroscience, where amazing revelations await to challenge everything you thought you knew about love. In this deep dive into the fascinating world of love, we'll explore the intricate connections between maternal affection and romantic love that go beyond what meets the eye. Did you know that scientific research has unveiled astonishing phenomena in romantic relationships such as heart rhythms synchronizing during co-sleeping, creating an almost mystical connection between partners? But that's not all. The impact of childhood trauma and the absence of maternal love on one's emotional well-being can be profound and enduring. These experiences disrupt the delicate equilibrium between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, fundamentally shaping how we regulate emotions in adulthood. Join us on this enlightening journey as we unravel the complex roles of oxytocin, vasopressin, and dopamine in nurturing bonds, igniting passion, and finally tuning our emotional response. We're going to look at maternal love and romantic or passionate love. Now, both maternal and passionate love are critical for the development and maintenance of humankind. Interestingly, research has shown that even physiological signals between two individuals within a romantic relationship synchronize. For example, human heart rhythms synchronize while co-sleeping. We've seen the effects of maternal separation in Harlow's monkeys, where the baby monkeys, after separation from the mother, moved towards a reward deficit state in a very short period of time, leading to isolation and stage of despair and detachment. We covered this in the other video where we looked at the neuroscience of trauma and hopelessness. Brain imaging studies, which have used activation likelihood estimation in these experiments, have shown that different regions in the brain are activated when either passionate love or maternal love is initiated. Now in this particular video, I will be covering love and the neuroscience. What I won't be going into too much detail though is attachment. Having said that, we know that maternal love bond attachment becomes very important for future relationships as well. But let's look at what key areas of the brain are activated and what neurotransmitters play a role in romantic love, maternal love and bonding. In maternal love, the left ventral tegmental area, so we know in the brainstem, the ventral tegmental area is the home of dopamine neurons. The right thalamus, thalamus is very much a processing area of the brain. The left substantia nigra, which again contains dopamine neurons, very high levels, high concentration of dopamine neurons, and the left Putamen. So putamen is a part of the substantia nigra, which is responsible for goal-directed action. And when we take these areas into account, we can see that dopamine plays a very, very important role but the bilateral ventral tegmental areas involved in passionate love or romantic love. Interestingly, what that highlighting is that in maternal love, there are higher order cognitive processes likely going on when it comes to romantic love, but it's likely that the underlying arousal areas, subcortical areas are more likely to be involved. Nonetheless, what it tells us is there are commonalities between maternal love and romantic love. In the late 1950s, John Bowlby, a renowned psychologist, developed the attachment theory. And this was developed after studying maternal bonds in primates and finding links between strong emotional attachment and nurturing behaviors. By regulating emotional responses to threats, mammals were able to develop safer attachments. When we apply this to clinical practice in psychiatry, you see attachment disruption, particularly in early childhood. So when we think about attachment, due to adverse childhood experiences, for example, adverse childhood experiences or trauma can affect attachment. The reason why attachment and bonding is so important is because it helps in development of an optimally balanced parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So when there is attachment disruption, what tends to happen is that the individual moves towards a reward deficit state or a reward deficiency state, similar to what was seen in Harlow's monkeys. So the reward deficit state affects cognitions, thoughts that we develop as children. And this can be characterized by low self-esteem, low self-worth, self-doubt, self-criticality. 
On the other hand, attachment also can influence emotional regulation. The emotional regulatory capabilities that we have is really a careful balance between the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic system. So in other words, the sympathetic drive, which often originates or is activated by the amygdala, if that is excessively heightened, one tends to live through life through a heightened sympathetic drive. And what that means is their emotional regulatory capabilities will be more sort of shifted towards a heightened state. And therefore these individuals may present with heightened sensitivity to criticality, for example, impulsivity, mood dysregulation. They may use maladaptive ways of coping, such as self-harming, for example, as a way of self-soothing. So essentially, emotional regulatory capabilities are also affected through attachment disruption. So two things here, the reward deficit state leading to a cascade down cognitive dysfunctional assumptions of self or schema and emotional regulatory capabilities affected as well, leading to an individual who's more prone to emotional dysregulation. And this is where we start thinking about schema therapy, for example, or we think about cognitive therapy. And in emotional regulation, we think about mindfulness or a DBT, dialectical behavioral techniques in treatment. So that's really about clinical practice, how we apply attachment. Now, there are three key neurotransmitters that play a very important part in love. We know that we have oxytocin and vasopressin, both of which play a really important part in bonding. So attachment and bonding relies on oxytocin and vasopressin. But we know that oxytocin and vasopressin combine with the brain's dopamine reward system. The dopamine is released from the ventral tegmental area, and we know that the release, particularly when we experience pleasure, happens in the nucleus accumbens. When it comes to love, oxytocin, vasopressin, Vasopressin and dopamine integrate and flood the brain with what we call these feel good hormones. In the initial stages of liking something, we tend to have dopamine, opioids, and GABA. So it's a more calming state when we think about liking. But what can happen is as it moves forward, bonding requires the presence of oxytocin and vasopressin. In fact, this is the reason why nasal sprays, for example, with oxytocin are being developed to calm down the anxiety because love has a calming effect on the amygdala, as we'll see in a bit. Intranasal oxytocin may facilitate bonding. Now, oxytocin and vasopressin are small peptides that have similar structures. They may have evolved from the same ancestral peptide in a way, and thus are both functionally and structurally interrelated. Both of them are involved in social attachment formation, pro-social and reproductive behaviors, including sexual and parental. When one actually thinks about the mother, we know that oxytocin's released, and it's particularly important for that bonding aspect post-delivery. We also know from a sexual perspective, the reason why when the cervix is stimulated or when the nipples are stimulated, oxytocin is released and that may facilitate bonding with the romantic or sexual partner. Both oxytocin and vasopressin, because they integrate with dopamine, play a role in reward processes and may therefore also be associated with endogenous opioid signaling. And this is a crucial and autoregulatory signaling system that is crucial for attachment, pleasure induction, response to separation, and overall stress reduction. Because we know that opioid release is a core feature of the experience of pleasure in the initial stages. So opioid, dopamine, and when it comes to love, we have oxytocin and vasopressin along with the others. From neuroimaging studies, we know that when it comes to maternal love, maternal love, as we saw earlier as well in the key parts that are involved, maternal love includes higher order processes. The cognitive affective regulation is present in maternal attachment. In romantic love, on the other hand, there is a greater desire to combine liking and wanting behaviors. Now, interestingly, liking and wanting behaviors are part of addiction phenomenon. So when individuals are exposed to substances, say illicit substances, that's the initial dopamine release that occurs in the nucleus accumbens. So when there's increased dopamine here, that is the initial experience of pleasure. The wanting aspect, in neuroscience, wanting actually means it's not so much a cognitive perspective. It's not so much the actual belief that I wanted where I'm thinking about it. It's more a visceral, uh, underlying arousal type wanting. So this is what happens in substance use disorders when liking is moved towards wanting, where it actually bypasses the frontal cortex straight to the habit system. So individuals with substance addiction, evidence has shown that it is the 
cues that trigger off excessive dopamine. So there's higher levels of dopamine activation in the striatum in individuals with addiction compared to the dopamine release that happens when they actually receive the drug. So the cues tend to have a stronger effect than the actual drug. And this is because repeated exposures with regards to the use of substances results in what's known as sensitization of this mesolimbic pathway. When this pathway is sensitized, what tends to happen is the actions move towards a more habitual form, and that is what is known as wanting. Now, across both types of love, we've seen that there is a common neurobiological mechanism which involves the ventral tegmental area. And in romantic love, there was a greater emphasis on the bilateral ventral tegmental area. So if we take a step back and reflect about the process of say falling in love and then bonding there are stages so initially there is liking which we said involves dopamine opioids and this liking then moves towards bonding and this is where we talked about the other neurotransmitters coming in in order to form bonds now most social bonding processes stem from the quality of attachment a mother or a caregiver builds with their infant during early life now even though the quality of attachment with the primary caregiver may be significantly disrupted fortunately social bonds are plastic and they are complex enough for a later secure attachment to modify an earlier insecure attachment so what this shows is that there is the possibility for the brain to sort of functionally or even structurally modify the impacts of trauma or insecure attachment from the past after one's experience a secure attachment later in life so therefore to summarize love comprises of a complex interplay between brain receptors hormones cognition and the reward pathways. Oxytocin produced in the hypothalamus and released from the pituitary gland to the amygdala and the brainstem which links to the autonomic nervous system. This is what generates a range of emotions. They could be negative emotions but of course lots of positive emotions linked to pleasure as well. To summarize the neurotransmitters, peptides again, oxytocin and vasopressin are more related to attachment and bonding as they're key hormones for both romantic maternal attachment but also released during orgasm, childbirth, breastfeeding. Their concentrations increase during the initial phase of pair bonding. There have been some really interesting experiments that have been done in prairie voles. And what they found is that the female, after an injection of oxytocin, will bond with the nearest male and actually stay bonded over an extended period of time. Now, we've talked about all of these different areas that are activated when it comes to love. But what isn't activated or what's the area that's deactivated? Experiments have shown that when we look at pictures of romantic partners, areas of the brain that decrease in activity are the amygdala. Now note, this is the fear, aggression, threat area of the brain. Next, the frontal cortex is also deactivated. If we take these two things and sort of integrate it to ask ourselves, what does this mean? Firstly, it tells us that love is soothing. By calming down that amygdala, it has benefits overall in stress reduction. This is probably why many people feel safe and happy in the romantic partner's arms or their company. Interestingly, in the context of neuroplasticity, love social bonding, just like music or exercise, plays an important part in neuroplasticity, resilience, etc. The deactivation of the prefrontal cortex is interesting because we're less likely to use scrutiny or we may not necessarily use the frontal parts of our brain and rely more on those primitive parts of the brain in order to make decisions. In other words, we may often be more forgiving of some of the things that might happen with our romantic partners compared to when we relate to other individuals. It's because the frontal cortex does not make those judgments because it is the seat of the judgment area as well. So I hope that this has given you an overview about what happens to our brain when we're falling in love and when we're bonded to someone. If you like the video, make sure you hit the like button and leave comments in the comment section. Let us know what else you'd like me to cover. I look forward to seeing you in another video soon. Until then, stay fascinated. Bye-bye.